Hello and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Historical Humans Podcast. My name's Justin Woods, and I'm joined today by my fellow co-hosts, Cullum Coleman and Aaron Gilpin. And today, we have a very special day. Today is our Season 3 finale, which means we have been trucking at this every two weeks for the past three years. So I hope you guys have been enjoying and I know Column has a few highlights for us that we're going to cover, so let's jump right into that. Yeah, yeah, it's been a wonderful three years on the internet with all of you here at uh, the Historical Humans channel or podcast, depending on where you're getting this. Thank you, or I'm sorry. That depends as well. <laughs> womp, womp. I don't <laughs> uh, And in that time, we have produced for you... Uh, Quite a large amount of content, and uh, this is just going to be our little highlight reel of all the wonderful things we've done together on this three-year journey. Uh, during this time, we have broadcast 78 podcasts, Ooh. R- read 139 works of literature, explored 59 World Heritage Sites, reacted to 261 archaeological events around the world brought you over 1,000 short episodes examined 11 waterways investigated four historical figures and exhumed one major historical city now the question i have for you guys and this is putting you on the spot is what has been your favorite episode that we have recorded of the podcast to date (laughs) I have a few honorable mentions. Like, I think our con series has been phenomenal, which we're actually deviating from that year. Honestly? Well, uh, you would think. Uh, Spoilers. My my (laughs) personal favorite, well, Aaron tries to uh, think what his is. My personal favorite has to be our season two finale, um, the Nazca line, because that idea, that concept was... uh, was the original idea behind historical humans. That was the first idea that we ever had for the, for the show. And we finally did it. I would say at least from season three, I would pick Simon Bolivar just because of the fucking wild ass life that man had. Bolivar was a good one. My personal favorite, I think is either Beringia or the Titanic, just because those are two of my favorites. (laughs) And you guys let us know down below what yours is as well, if you have a favorite. I know it's a hard one, but yeah. yeah, Today's episode, though, is quite a different one from one that we have covered so far. Because I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but pirates weren't just in the Caribbean. Which is kind of mind-boggling, because we always think of that as being the true golden age of piracy. However... We're actually going to be covering the Black Sails Fleet, which is one of the most uh, prolific pirate fleets ever. Isn't there an HBO show about this? Um, I don't know about that. There, there is a, I know there's a Netflix series on. Oh, um, called Black Sails, but it's on not the Caribbean one. But I don't believe. No, I don't believe there's a show about this in particular. Uh-huh. And part of that is because. Um, we are running at you with a little bit of a misnomer here on Black Sails Fleet. There, this podcast is going to change its subject a couple of different times uh, just because of how convoluted the history of this uh, of this little corner of the world is. Also kind of fun, this is one of the original topics that we started the concept of this podcast off with. This has been on the back burner for three years now. And now Cullen gets his vindication as it finally found its slot in the schedule. I think it's it's not better... vindication, it's yeah. pure chaos. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there was a reason why it was on the back burner for so long. Well, let's uh, dive into yeah. it and see, eh? Yep. That, all right, so the Black Sails fleet here, it's an Asian pirate fleet that primarily plundered the South China Sea. And its primary time of operation is from 1801 to 1810. And the reason for that is a person we're going to get to meet a little bit later on when we pivot away from the fleet entirely for about 40 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) But before we can get to that, 
Um, if you thought we were talking about the Black Sails fleet, you were wrong. Because as it so happens, this fleet gets its start during what is known as the Sino-French War in Vietnam. That's right. It's from it's from Nam. Not <laughs> hold on, wait a minute. Not the Nam that most Americans think of. It is Vietnam as the country we know it today. However, this is peak peak French colonialism more than anything yep. else. I keep forgetting the French were in Vietnam. They were yeah. in Vietnam, Cambodia, I believe some parts of Thai. Like the they French. owned like half of West Africa at one point. Yeah, yeah the French were pretty the, sly the, with their with yeah, their the, colonization. The French were everywhere, but uh, during uh, this time from 1783 to 1785, the French and the Chinese are fighting for control of Vietnam, and what would become this fleet starts off there as privateers. Except the war ends after two years. <laughs> and they have nowhere to go. Privateers, so, for those playing at home, by the way, are usually ship captains that are hired out on behalf of nations to either fight on their behalf or, like, quote, not quite fight on their behalf, but usually plunder and raid and just be an overall nuisance to, to water routes. Their, their job... the privateers were replaced by what is known as submarine warfare because their primary goal was disrupt shipping. Yeah. Yeah. So you were getting paid to rob the other guy's uh, trade routes. Yeah. In the 1500s, the English famously did this. This is what eventually led to the uh, golden age of piracy in the Caribbean. Yeah. So, and, you know, and hire privateers like the, at your own <laughs> risk. Yeah. Just like the English, this backfires horribly for the Chinese because all the privateers realized the reason China kept hiring them was because China didn't have a navy. And since France does and is now in control of Vietnam, guess where they go? Dun, 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 Why didn't That's they right. have a navy? What? <laughs> well, you got to <laughs> remember, at this point in time, Aaron... This is at pretty much the downfall of what was eventually, or this was the beginning of the downfall for the Qing Empire. And mm -hmm. up until this point, they had practiced very severe isolationism. So them not having a navy was part of that isolationism. They weren't yeah. going to build a navy to explore or to travel when they were very insular, very self-sufficient, very closed off to the outside world. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah the Chinese Qing... history isn't my forte, so I yeah, the, I yeah, mix the... up the dynasties all the time. Yeah. So I'm thinking I might have been thinking of the Ming dynasty. Yeah, the the, the the Ming were much more prolific. The Qing had a philosophy that basically said, China is big, China is populous. We will let whatever tries to invade us come in, and then overwhelm them with weight of numbers. Oh, uh, okay. It was they were they were a human wave Normandy type tactic uh, as far as uh, as far as they were willing to go and that's pretty much all you needed to ensure China's territorial integrity for a few hundred years but we're not talking about China because uh, when these uh, fleets go into China they form what is known as the uh, Guangdong Pirate Confederation which there is some argument as to how big it gets. Some sources uh, say it contained between 400 and 600 ships and about 40,000 to 60,000 pirates at its height. Some estimates say there could be a, there could have been as many as 1,200 to 1,800 vessels with 70,000 pirates. And how many ships is that? Uh, it's like a modern aircraft well, carrier holds about 5,000 people. Yeah. So the, that's 70,000 people at the largest. Yeah. Yeah. At its, at its large. So basically, the general estimate is about 100 men to a ship is, is, the, uh, is the estimate for about how tightly packed it gets. The reason these way, numbers are, the reason these numbers are very, um, 
contested and off is because there was a lot of ship sinking and crew losing and just general changing of hands that went on. This wasn't an official government. And even though they had good records and there are records of how many of what surrendered where, there's, you know, there's no exact number. So it kind of changes, especially as the fleet also changes size. This uh, confederation will grow and shrink over time. Okay, so it's kind of like, do they have an island base? Like, the like similar to what Nassau was in the Caribbean? Not quite, but they did base a lot of their efforts out of the Pearl River, which is now in modern-day Canton, uh, all the way down to the Gulf of Tonkin. Oh, so okay. they had yeah. some base of operation. Yeah, they, yeah. Uh, effectively, what they did was because, you know, a thousand ships is more than any harbor can handle at this time. What they did is the Confederation had divided itself into six fleets red, black, white, yellow, green, and blue, with black and red being the largest. And each division effectively like a corporate monopoly, claimed a different part of the South China Sea. So depending on where you were, you would be targeted by different pirates. For example, if you were in Macau or Canton, you would be targeted by the Red Fleet. Okay. Because the Pearl River Delta itself belonged to the Red Fleet. And the other five fleets had all agreed, we will not raid in Red Fleet territory. We're a confederation. We've all divvied up the ocean. This, uh, this won't really last. Um, because even though they control everything from the Pearl River to the Gulf of Tonkin, um, their command undergoes a very drastic change. And uh, the head of the pirate uh, the head of the pirate confirmation is it's got uh, Xi Yang, Zheng Yi Shao, uh, Xi, uh, was it, uh, Zheng Gu, Shek Yong, and Xing Shi. I apologize for those pronunciations. I cannot keep it all straight in my head. Gotta um, get like a like an asterisk that shows up every single time. We just yeah. need yeah. this asterisk. Cullum does not speak any language other than English. That is also debatable. Subscri subscribe and comment down below, and we'll force Cullum to take a five year Mandarin course, and we'll revisit not... this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that'd be uh, hilarious. And the fun thing is that all these people are the same person, just under a different name. I like to think that this person just changed their hat each time. The color of the hat. It's still the exactly. same design and everything. It's just red <laughs> cap, black cap, blue cap, yellow cap. Yeah, where we know. Um, they're all the same person. Uh, she's born Shi Yang, and she gets various different names as her notoriety grows. Um, she gets one of her more famous names, Zheng Yixiao, when she marries Zheng Ye in 1801 and that name just means uh shang's wife of course it, it does it's it's literally the equivalent of um i don't know who they are and i'm too scared to ask at this point this is um this is a bob's wife oh <laughs> yeah. what's her name the wife of bob bob's, she's bob's wife we don't quite like no one knows it's just bob's wife <laughs> Zheng's yeah. Now, what's interesting is she got this name when she was abducted by Zheng during a pirate raid. Um, oh my he god. He effectively looted the brothel she worked at. So, quite literally, I didn't choose the pirate life. The pirate life chose me. Oh, yeah. They fall for each other and actually have some very complementary skills. Because Zhang is an experienced and very capable naval commander. He is 
the de facto leader of the Confederation. He commands the Red Sail Fleet. And she is a very astute businesswoman. So you can see how this relationship forms between them very quickly of someone who knows how to make money and someone who knows how to save money. Yep, yeah, yeah, that's a good combo. Yeah. And they become very powerful because suddenly Zeng's plunder is going a lot further than it used to. I mean, hey. You mean if I just carry the zero and divest, yeah. this money grows? <laughs> It's just like, it's like, forget math. Just marry the woman and have her do it for you. Fair. I'm just saying, um, logistics will get you anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And um, she will take over the Pirate Confederation in 1807 after Zheng Yi dies to a typhoon. He gets swept overboard and he drowns. And there's, Damn, um, that's what a pirate way to go, though. Yeah, like it's unusual. You don't hear it, but like, it still feels on brand. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And well, Zheng Yi had founded the Confederation. Um, uh, Qing Shi, as we will be calling her from, I believe, this point out, is the first to enter the debate of succession. So what happens with his death is. The commanders of all the vessels from all the fleets gather in one place to discuss what they're going to do now. Because Zheng and his Red Fleet were the reason the Confederation exists. He was the, the personality behind the Alliance. And being pirates, they are a democracy. <laughs> so all the commanding officers, all the captains all the quartermasters, all the all the heads of anything are all gathered together to have a debate over who should lead us. And when they open the floor to say, stake your claim, the first person to step through is this woman. <laughs> Good for her. I mean, I mean, yeah. she she did most of the work anyway half the time, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah, she definitely did. She managed the business side. Um, she is responsible for um, what was known as the Pirate Offices of Canton, which was um, there were actual buildings you could go to on the docks where there were just pirates living in there. And you would go there and you would say, I am a salt merchant. I am leaving tonight from Canton. I am going to Macau. Here is... A hundred and fifty dollars. Do not rob me. <laughs> and they would write down his ship. They would write down where he was going, and they would send him on his way. And it's a protection racket. She ran. She ran the Red Fleet protection racket. Oh my God! It's quite literally mob mentality of like that, but... <laughs> you you can you can give us a hundred and fifty yen or yuan, and uh, you know yeah. we'll make sure no no misfortunes befall you before you make it to Macau. Yeah. It'd be a real it, shame if something happened to that lovely little salt vessel of yours. Yep. Yeah. That's what you know, that was effectively her job. That was what she did. She she had effectively monopolized the salt trade for the Red Fleet. So she, she was a very established commander at this point. <laughs> so she knew what she was doing when oh, yeah. she took that claim. Well, that and she also just kind of leaned into traditional practices of the time because women usually weren't allowed in a lot of aspects of public life in China. But you got to remember, one, these were pirates. And two, a lot of the people who became pirates were people from the coastal areas that turned to crime. And a lot of times, if you're poor enough, when you die, your wife has to take over. Otherwise, you have no money coming in. So it was kind of... a. Uh, a combination of those things where it's like, hey, you're dead, but there's no one to keep bringing money in, and, uh, well, she's doing yeah. an alright job. Yeah, yeah, so, there, yeah, so the first disadvantage she has, which would be the fact that she's a woman, is negated by the fact that she's not 
running in high society for this office. She's running among people who were so poor, they chose crime over starvation. So she's got the fisherman's creed on her side saying, yeah, my husband died. I take over his ship. What's the problem? <laughs> That's fair. Except there is a problem. Oh no! Because when she because when she steps forward, everyone turns and looks at the man she has to compete with, Chung Po Sai, who is Zheng Yi's adoptive son. Ooh. He is a young man, but he is an adult. He is a popular commander, who is very spiritually devout, and believed to be immortal, for some of the incredibly reckless actions he has survived taking now a man after my own heart oh man <laughs> yeah th th this man is um this man is believed to have a divine providence among the confederation to raid the seas Too so stupid when, and stubborn to die i'm all about it yeah so when xing shi steps forward and says i am zeng yi's wife you all know me as Zheng Yi's wife. Give me, you know, give me command. Everyone looks at Cheng Po. And, um, Cheng Po steps forward and announces that, um, Qing Shi has named him Commander of the Red Fleet under her. Oh, the Red Fleet is the largest of the uh, of the six fleets. Its main rival is the Black Fleet, which is the top, you know, the subject of today's uh, <laughs> video. And that combination is enough to shut down all the other claimants. And you know that there's nothing they can do. And this is a major shift in the Confederation because it's no longer just an alliance of six pirate fleets divvying up the land among themselves. It now has a singular head of state detached from any fleet that rules them all. One ruler to rule them all. I've heard yeah. this story. Yeah, the, yeah. She, she basically reinvents herself as the ring of power. <laughs> and, uh, and takes control of the fleets and with the red fleet backing her unanimously and her chief rival being the commander of that fleet there's the other five just fall into line yeah that's such good politicking though you would be surprised you'd be amazed that she wasn't a woman of high society but with that exception if she did come from a brothel you know, mm -hmm. usually their clientele were high society, so she probably did get a few tips and tricks along the way. She true yeah. as it always was yeah. done. But yeah. by the time she meets uh, Zhang Yi in 1801, she already understands accounting. The pirates didn't teach her that. She brought that to them. <laughs> so, you know, she... Behold, she I bear the, gifts. That's what like I'm saying, though. Literacy. Like, she brought a lot to this piracy group and, like, yeah. had so much experience that when it came time, they are like, Yarg, that be making a lot of sense. Arg, yeah. there be many changes about. <laughs> yeah. And, um, to fit this new social order within the Confederation, Qing Shi develops what is known as Qing Shi's Legal Code. It's a very simple legal code. Disobedience results in beheading, regardless of rank. I mean, that's another way to make people fall in line real quick. Yeah. Additionally, the Confederation will now have a centralized bureaucracy. This bureaucracy serves exactly one purpose. To ensure that all loot taken will be taken into a common trust. Oh and, no, redistribute the wealth. Yeah, yeah. And it works something like this. If you raid a vessel, you keep 20% for your ship. The other 80% goes into a common centralized fund managed by Qing Shi for the repair, maintenance, and supply of all fleet vessels. So... 
Black Fleet plunder might fund Red Fleet expansion. Hmm. Things like that. All vessels will now travel with an accountant <laughs> whose job is to tally up the loot when you get it and ensure that you are taking only your share and are delivering the rest to Ching Shi. That's a great way to keep people honest, though, especially if they're on every ship. I just mm -hmm. can't imagine the sound of an abacus rolling around during a battle. Yeah, he's just he's just standing. He's just he's just standing there, you know, you know, one soldier's garment soiled, <laughs> one, you know, you know, you know, one military cutlass bloodied. <laughs> It's like you just see them blast a, a cannon shot through the ship, and it goes, all right, one ship lost. All right, how much goods do you think were in that ship when it went down? <laughs> yeah, he's just, he's just leaning overboard as, like, the people from the other ship are going, say, how much are you worth? <laughs> <laughs> are we really doing that now? <laughs> They're just having a whole fight. But yeah. Uh, additionally, the Confederation will expand their protection racket to all maritime traffic. In 1807, Xing Shi feels that with the centralized bureaucracy and with, you know, the unification of herself and the Red Fleet, she can effectively blockade everything. This will create some enemies for the fleets because... She doesn't just go after the merchants with the luxury goods like the salt, like they were doing before. She targets the fishermen. And the opium trade. Yeah, it's always the foreign, opium. Yep. Foreign vessels, such as the Portuguese in Macau or the British with their opium, used to be exempt from the you know protection money from the racket. Because no one wanted to take a fight with them. There was plenty of money to be made cornering the Chinese salt market. Well, the market's cornered, so now everyone's a target. Well, and it was also one of those things of, like, you don't ruffle too many feathers to where you remain anonymous. It's like, you you mm. commit enough to be annoying, but not enough for them to actually do something about. Here, they're, they just start straight up targeting them now. Yeah. And the indiscriminate targeting under Ching Shi only increases as she uses her bureaucracy to effectively coordinate in time coastal raiding so that you are raided on a regular basis, almost like you're getting a tax collection. Oh, oh no. It's the that tax way, man. This way, they don't accidentally burn down a town that couldn't pay because they already paid a previous vessel a few weeks earlier. And that's effectively what they do. They go town by town along the coast saying, pay us or die. They kill a few, most pay. <laughs> One doesn't this... pay, they burn it down, and the next town hears about it. Yep. Yep, and they're spacing it out just enough to make sure that everybody knows and everyone's got time to gather together money for when they show up. This angers the Qing emperors of China who proved themselves completely inadequate and powerless to stop the Confederation. Oh no, where have I heard this story before? Yep. Now, the Qing have neglected their navy to the point where they don't have one. There is no professional navy. They have, the government employs zero sailors. No one in the government knows how to drive a boat. That's kind of funny. Oh, no. <laughs> and this leads to issue number two, which is the Qing military philosophy of overwhelming numbers means overwhelming force. Their mentality is they will go into a port and say, you there, you have a fishing boat and you have a merchant vessel. These are now property of the Qing government. They put their land garrison full of swords and pikes on it and have it sail at the pirates. That's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see how it pays off. 
Now, can you imagine how a rowboat full of swordsmen fares against, I don't know, a ship with guns? Mm, not well. I don't think it's a pretty well and fair fight. Let's be real. Was it in the middle of the night? Was this like a night raid? Or, no, no, middle of the this day. Is just, it's like the sunniest this, day possible. This is straight up. The Chinese government goes into a city, confiscates all vessels, moves the city's garrison onto those vessels, and has them sail directly towards whatever hot spot of piracy there is. There are no tactics. There is no skill. These are men. In, you know, these are men with, with no ranged weapons whatsoever, except maybe some rifles. Going up against, uh, effectively, other fishing vessels that have been outfitted with cannons. Jesus Christ! What's even worse is the Qing government doesn't have a single vessel built in the 19th century to call upon. Everything they've got is at least 20 years out of date. Most of what they have dates back to the Sino-French War in 1780 or 1785. Oh my gosh. So anything they have, the pirates ditched 20 years ago. This is what isolationism gets you guys. This is what it gets you. Yep. A defunct navy and a useless figurehead. Yep. And this led to a number of fleets being destroyed by the Confederation's ambush tactics, which effectively amounted to flashing your ass at the law, hiding behind a rock, waiting for the law to approach said rock, jumping out, shooting it, and then having a bunch of men in what are effectively rowboats row at the other ship and climb aboard to beat the ever-loving daylights out of them. It's effective. Yeah. I, I mean... This... <laughs> this is so bad, it shatters... It's like, it's like something out of a fucking gag. I know. It shatters at least three Qing fleets before they figure out how to do anything about it. What? Yeah, they, they lose three fleets before they realize this is a bad strategy. <laughs> That's how slow the government is. Through. Well, yeah. don't you know, first time, shame on you. Second time, shame on me. Third time, shame on your whole family. Oh, I'm so yep. stupid. I'm done. I'm out of here, guys. <laughs> yeah, and it, this, this increases the reputation of the ships of the Confederation and, and their fleets because it's effectively a shock and awe tactic. It's appear out of nowhere... And send in so, overwhelming force. <laughs> I fucking hate this here, Beth. I yeah. hate it. <laughs> what the hell? And things go pretty well for almost a year. And then we have January of 1808, in which point Ching Shi commits the one crime you must never commit. Being a woman on a pirate ship. In China. No, no it's killing someone who's sent to speak with you. It's like, nope. Oh, an emissary. Nope, nope, not even that. She kills the provincial commander. She kills the officer of the fleet sent to kill her. God forbid. Yeah, because apparently the one unforgivable crime in Peking is killing a man that Peking has paid to murder you. <laughs> And, you know, the uh, reason uh, for this is the Chinese have this idea of chivalry wherein officers are exempt from being casualties of war. Uh, it's like the it's like knights in medieval Europe. You didn't really want to kill them because it was much more profitable to just ransom them. Yeah. And also their armor was really tough. So it's like, even if you did kill them, it's like, well, now I don't get money. Yeah, well, with with, the, with this, it's kind of the idea that the officers are sort of above the combat. Yes, they're directing it. Yes, they're a part of it. But their lives should never really be in danger. I mean, they are a noble-born gentleman. Uh, Do you know how much it's it like costs a British aristocracy? It, yeah. It's basically the it's basically that's how the British military was until yeah. for like 
up until the Crimean War. Yeah. So no wonder they're so functionally ineffective. Yeah, because the, the, their whole philosophy is your officers are someone who's related to somebody. You killed somebody who was the second cousin of the roommate of the dog walker of the emperor's nephew. <laughs> that is beyond unforgivable. You have attacked God himself. Dishonor among you and your family. Dishonor upon your cow. Yep. <laughs> so the Qing send a man named Bai Ling to put down the confederation. Wait, I know that name. He will not do this. Where do I know that name from? Uh, I don't know. Maybe from uh, the, the uh, Siege of Lantau, which will be the next pivot point we go to instead of talking about the fleet. Oh, no. <laughs> so, Spy Ling <laughs> arrives in time to put down an end to a massive invasion of the Pearl River. And I say arrives in time because he effectively gets there at the end of 1808, which is... You know, about a year after everything that's gone wrong starts happening. Um, what has happened uh, in this invasion is Ching Shi has decided that she wants to sack both Canton and Macau at the same time. So, in July, Ching Po uh, annihilates the fleet sent to guard the Pearl River meaning that there is no Chinese military force in the Pearl River Delta at all for about six months. <laughs> okay. There's also, no... I decided to look up the river real quick because I was like, yeah. wait a minute, where do... And I was like, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, this explains a lot now. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, what river? Oh, right. I forgot this thing is huge. Stupidly huge. It's a <laughs> massive river delta. And it's during this time that the Confederation goes on a full-on bloodbath raid. They spend a year just sacking and pillaging and burning everything. No mercy. No warning. Just every day a different ship will pull into port and start setting things on fire. Fine. <laughs> Because this is this is this is Chang Shi's magnum opus. This is her saying to the world, "I am power." Yeah, you can't you can't contest this. But, Even the but, Qing Dynasty attempted to put me down, and they can't. Yeah, the government has spent over a year at this point sending armadas after her, harassing her pirates, attempting to stop them. They've been ineffective, and so now she is telling China. I am Lord of the Sea. Pay me or burn. And she's oh, giving yeah. them a taste of what burn means. I love it. And here's where the Black Sails Fleet distinguishes itself. Because the Black Sails Fleet wins the award for bloodiest raid of the entire Confederation. Oh no. They kill 10,000 people in a single endeavor, a single attack. They they prove that even though they are the second fleet, even though they are effectively, you know, the right-hand fleet behind the, the red fleet, they prove that they are the attack dog of this confederation, that they are what gives it teeth. They might not be the tactical ones, but they are the vicious ones. Yeah, I like that. Chang Shi is going to bank on this reputation later. She's going to bank on it big time. I mean, hell, it worked for the Spartans. Yeah. But Bai Ling is crafty. He's He proves that he's patient and intelligent. He lets Canton and Macau and the Pearl River Delta burn. Because he knows he doesn't have a navy to contend with them. So instead what he does is he shuts down all coastal land-based trade in the entire region. Ooh. Ooh. This means the pirates do not have a means of resupply. 
They can't get food. They can't get lumber. They can't get fresh water. Not to mention Everything... all the wealth that they're trying to raid comes from those trade networks. Yep. Everything they're trying to get is locked up. It's been pushed inland. Where they can't really get at it because they're not foot soldiers. The Chinese are good at foot soldiers. The Confederation is not. Oh, no. So what happens when the Europeans come knocking and go, hey, where did everybody go? Oh, there. that's the that's going to be the third part, right behind the second part. Oh, no. Which is that Bai Ling redeploys all the garrisons to stop defending the, the cities and instead start training a peasant militia in military matters so that every time the fleets raid somewhere... The peasants know how to fight back. They coordinate. They use tactics. They inflict casualties against these pirates. Oh, so now they're just making life. They're just making it so, yeah. like, the the risk is there's a bigger risk there the, compared yeah. to the reward. Yeah, well, yeah but, you know, it's a lot of yeah. it's a much different story when you're going up against untrained farmers. When the farmers have some level of training. The fight gets a little more equalized, especially on land. Yeah. yeah. When, you, when you've given everyone a matchlock and taught them how to dig a foxhole, suddenly running into town and setting things on fire turns into a death trap. <laughs> yeah, the, the, I just like to imagine like a bunch of them just walked into town and suddenly they're in the town square and then all the doors and windows fly open and just a bunch of guns. Yeah, and everyone just opens fire. Guns, arrows, anything they have. It's pretty Bricks. much the scene from uh, Pirates of the Caribbean when uh, when Captain Jack Sparrow walks into the bar and there's just 80 pistols aimed at him. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's the pirate life. And uh, But yeah, Aaron, you hit on the third and final thing he does, which is Bai Ling hires the British to deal with this. I believe he hires specifically the British vessel Mercury, though I could not confirm that, to effectively sit in the middle of the River Delta and fire on anything that's not waving government colors. Oh my god. Yeah. And this is the one move Qing Shi could not predict. That the Qing dynasty, that the that Bai Ling here would resort to bringing foreigners into an internal matter. If I, I don't know where I saw this. Um, like it was, it was like recent, but I said like, it was talking about how the Qing dynasty uh, really, really hates, or at least like has this as like that superiority complex over any foreigners, especially the English yeah. Or like, yeah, yeah the, the the Qing's response to a diplomatic gift exchange was, "We thank the King of England for his tribute and acknowledge his subjugation before us as a vassal." What the fuck? That was their statement. At which point, the English rescinded their gifts of what I believe was a globe. <laughs> <laughs> But you must have a really nice globe, though. I, I do yeah. want to emphasize again how much the Qing Dynasty was an isolationist uh, empire. So for them to have any sort of contact with the British, with the Portuguese, just shows how much of a thorn in the side this uh, Confederacy was. Like they're not gonna, they're not gonna bend those rules, those laws, specifically for that reason. Yep. Ugh. But Bai Ling brings them in. Ching Shi is shocked. She is trapped in the River Delta. There's no room to maneuver. Her usual strategy and the Confederation standard tactics was when you encounter a foreign gunship, you circle them and just whittle them down shot at a time because they have to turn and broadside you. You, you outmaneuver them. You're in a river. There's Not only one way to go. And it's right into their cannons. So her fleet is devastated. She is driven out of Canton within seven days. Wow. 
and she makes it to one of her main bases, which is Lantau, with only seven functional ships. Damn. She is forced to beach the majority of her fleet for repairs. Also, kind of another important thing to note is at this time, the British Navy was one of the most agile and strongest in the world. Oh, yeah. That was kind of their huge advantage was their ships were a lot smaller and more maneuverable. Kind of yep. leaning to the victory here. I mean, yep. that was part of the reason the whole Spanish Armada yep. failed was the British ships were a lot quicker. Well, yep, yep. Uh, and that was the 1500s, but this is the 1800s. Yeah. This, this the, is they slightly definitely after, a but like the... Yeah. The point still stands that they had a very astute naval power. And yeah. They were very, yeah. very well trained for it. Yeah, the, the, the British mentality was get a lower ballast so that you can go up rivers. Whereas a lot of other navies like the Spanish and the Portuguese focused on a broader profile for more firepower per ship. And the English were like, I'm just going to dance around you and shoot you ten times. And that was... The Confederation's response to the British was, we'll dance around you and shoot you ten times. But they're stuck in a river. <laughs> and uh, she gets to uh, she gets to Lantau in November. And on November 9th, she sees tall masts approaching on the horizon. Lantau is effectively a little island out, just outside of the delta of the Pearl River. And... Um, it's got a nice little bay, one, maybe two ways in. It's deep water. The Portuguese have come for vengeance. Oh, as no. a fleet of four Portuguese ships just line up on the other end of the bay, staring down her seven uh her seven Chinese junks. <laughs> mm. And they they just they look at each other, and the battle begins. With most of Ching Shi's fleet beached. She sends a dispatch to every Confederation vessel. Almost a thousand ships. Send help to Lantau. And after three days of siege, the Red Fleet answers with Cheung Po. He brings what's left of the Red Fleet, which had been caught along with uh, Ching Shi in the, in the Pearl River Delta. It is not at its full strength, it's pretty badly beat, too. And this is where he brings news. The Black Fleet, which Ching Shi had been relying on their reputation as the most vicious and bloodiest of the pirates, as well as their numbers relatively unscathed by the, you know, incident with the British, to sweep away these Portuguese. They've defected to the Chinese government. Oh. The, the Black Sails fleet basically trades pardon and becomes a semi-independent merchant marine navy for the Chinese. Dang. I mean, I guess if you... I mean, I guess it works. It works. It... I mean, there is a certain degree of legitimization that we don't tend to talk about with piracy... And this is the the antithesis, but a lot of pirates in across the world, it doesn't matter if it was the British pirates or Spanish pirates or even Chinese, where a lot of times, if you were an astute naval commander, a lot of times they'd say, look, you did bad, but, and it's usually a pretty big but, but they're like, you could really help us, and, you know, we'll just kind of look the other way here. And, you know, you keep control of your men. And I guess, like, a steady payroll, too, doesn't hurt. Yeah. Yeah. The, basically, the Black Sails fleet saw the, uh, saw the British intervention at, uh, at the Pearl River as a sign that things had escalated beyond the Confederation's ability to control. And so they turned and said... Well, we're going to take the easiest way out, which is become the Chinese Navy. I mean, there is no code of ethics or conduct that they really yep. are tied to, so yeah. I mean, it was also an extremely corrupt government that was in control. Not yet. Yeah. So so's the Confederation. <laughs> How many of those accountants do you think are honestly reporting everything to Ching oh. Shi? Yeah, of course. One but for like, me, one for thee. Yeah. And uh, 
To make matters worse, um, I feel she's... like she would have a pretty good strict as a. I feel like she'd have a pretty good strict background or like hold on the financial yeah. sector. Yeah, she's she's got a pretty good hold of it, but there's only so much control you have. You have to trust right. every officer on every ship. Yeah, true. You need the right group of people together. And to make matters worse, following Xiong Po into um into Lantau are sixty more Chinese warships and twenty five converted fishing vessels. Ooh. Damn. Uh, to barricade them. So what Ching Shi does is she ties her seven junks together to form a blockade so that the Chinese can't just sail up into the river, land troops uh, at the end of the bay, and overwhelm her with thousands and thousands of you know, infantry. Like they probably this would really have done. Yeah, like, so she's, like she's effectively creating a bottleneck. Yeah, the the Qings were kind of like the Roman Republic in terms of how they viewed naval warfare, which was do anything you can to turn it into a land battle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how they yeah. fuck it, it. Yeah. I mean, when you're good at one thing, but geez. Yeah. You play to your strengths. I respect it. Yeah. No. So Bai Ling proves himself a capable naval commander during this siege. He does a rolling barrage where he has all his ships conga line. And as they enter the mouth of the bay, they turn, they fire, they move out. The next ship enters behind them so that there is zero time between shots and volleys. Because it would take longer for one ship to just reload than it would be to have the ships just constantly move in a giant circle. This barrage fails to break uh, the Confederation's defenses. So after two days, they deploy uh, what is known as um, fire ships. Oh, yeah. Which is where, where you, this is where you fill a raft with as much explosives and gunpowder and oil and pitch as you can, shove it down river at someone, and let the wind and current take it into their ships to set fire to them and cause explosions. Yeah, that still happens to this day. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a dirty tactic. It's a pirate tactic. It's highly and effective. It's very effective. And I think we found where the black sails went. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I could not confirm that they were the 60 ships that showed up, but it does seem strange that suddenly Bai Ling has a navy. Yeah. <laughs> Two days after the uh, the Black Sails defect. The thick thickens. Yep. And Ching Shi does a very admirable defense. She staves off all but two of the fire ships. And those last two have the same problem that chemical weapons do in World War One. The uh, wind turns halfway there, and they turn back and start sailing into the <laughs> their point of origin. I love that so much. At which point, the pirates all realize the wind's on their side. They can finally escape. There's been very little wind for several days. So they unbeach all of their vessels and make a run for it using the weakest, oldest, and most damaged ships as human shields against the barrage of the much larger and much angrier government forces. I mean, again, and that's, they, that's effective. Yep. And after nine days of siege at Lantau, not only do they escape, but they've managed to repair the entire Red Fleet. And for the cost of all this, they have suffered the loss of 40 men and zero ships. That's insane. That's, that is an that's insane That's a great number. deal. Great value. Because they just run. They are smaller and faster than everything that is trying to kill them. That also implies that the, the human shields, the ships that they used, also did not sink in this in this endeavor. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Little, little advantage of... Uh, sort of what you see happen whenever a large fleet enters a small area. 
the ships couldn't get out of each other's way fast enough to deal with the uh, the the burning ships that were coming back up the uh, bay at them. So they were they had to scatter completely and then reform. And so their volleys were, you know, intermittent and ineffective. But uh, Lantau, despite failing to stop the Confederation, exposes its weakness and marks the end of the fleets. Still, so, yeah, that's like that's a pretty wild. It's still a really impressive siege uh, to like yeah. survive and escape, only to get and to get and all your ships out. I think the only yeah. thing that would make this better is if she just turned around and made some absurd demands at the government. Yeah. yeah. Well, she kind of will, because... Oh, no. <laughs> both both Bai Ling and Xing Shi realize that the Black Sails fleet defecting and taking pardons, the Confederate time is ended. It is encircled by now three hostile forces. The Western powers, the Chinese government, and the Black Sails fleet. Its, its power in relevance are only going to decline from here, but it can still do massive damage right now. So the goal is stopping it from doing damage right now. Yeah. So Ching Shi decides we will end this confederation. We will, I will negotiate with the government for the ability for everyone to just sort of walk away from this. Which that and in so, itself, I think, is kind of badass. <laughs> yep. So she sends to Peking a list of terms, which are as follows, and they are absolutely hilarious. Full pardon for all members of the Confederation. All loot taken by the Confederation is to be retained. The Confederation's members will be given the opportunity to enlist in the Chinese army or be granted means from the Chinese government to establish themselves as civilians. And finally, Ching Shi and Chong Po, who, by the way, are now married. Oh, wow. She married her first husband's adopted son. Let's not look into that. It's terrifying. I mean, to be fair, he was an adoptive son and wasn't theirs. That's kind of... Morally, yeah. I think this is probably yeah. the most like morally green thing we've seen, where it's not even really in a gray zone. It's just kind of like a. All it's probably right. more of a. It's probably more of a consolidation of power kind of thing. Well, and in China, a lot of times, what will happen is business owners will adopt someone to take over the business on their behalf, and that's yeah. exactly what happened here. Was he adopted yeah. Chang Po as as an emissary to basically take the reins upon his death? Yeah. And, you know, his wife was just too crafty to let that happen, so she made sure that there were all her bases were covered. And she says, the two of them will retain a small fleet to serve as salt merchants in Canton. You know, the thing she was extorting <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the government looks at this and goes, no punishment for anyone. We pay everyone's retirement plan. <laughs> And the most notorious pirate in all China gets to maintain a small fleet. They reject her unilaterally. So the Confederation does a massive raid of the Pearl River Delta. They do the thing that got them in trouble last time. Beautiful. Only this time, they're not extracting wealth. They're just burning everything to the ground and even in this raid they do not match the ferocity of the black sails fleet during the previous raid in 1808 because no one is as mean as the black sails fleet that's what we yeah. learned here. yeah but at a certain point like when you're just burning everything and you're not doing it for any monetary gain you're doing it out of spite and to prove a point, and I think they did it's just to that. send a message. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, and and to send that point, 
Ching Shi herself marches into Canton and represents her terms personally to Bai Ling. <laughs> and they spend the next several days debating this. And every time Bai Ling says no to something, she looks out the window, points to a building, and it burns down. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. Is bad. that actually what happened? Yeah, every time he refuses her, she says, attack. Oh and her people God. burn something down in Canton. Wow. I mean, it sucks for the people the people who are like probably using that building, but like Or living there or the people yeah. whose money it was losing. Like that was destructive, it, but that's badass. And Hashtag gets, girl boss. And it gets to the point that Bai Ling is willing to agree almost immediately to all the terms except letting her keep a fleet. Mm. And she keeps burning things for about three days before he gives up on that too. <laughs> I mean, I do understand his point. You don't want to give your enemy exactly what they've used to be your enemy. Yeah. But, oof. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Two days after they agree to this treaty, the entire fleet amasses in Canton and surrenders. They wow. had at least 1,100 cannons. <laughs> 1,100. Yeah. Oh. Now, this is where we get to see some happy endings here and some not so happy endings. Ching Shi will go on to run a gambling house in Canton. She gives up on her fleet dreams. She runs a gambling house. Her husband, Cheng Po, runs it with her, but I believe he runs the fleet and the salt merchants. So they kind of both, you know, they both make out like bandits happily ever after. She is still not an upstanding citizen. <laughs> <laughs> Old habits die hard. Yeah, I mean, yeah. good for her. That's that's a more ethical thing, I think. The house always wins. Yeah. Now, the Confederation and Qing Shi's career exposes China's shortcomings. Yet the Chinese refuse to do anything about this. The Qing don't take the 600 ships and 1100 cannons they've been given by these pirates and say we have a navy they just let it all go to waste and um ching shi will actually live because she dies in 1844 she will live to see the british sail up the pearl river and do the exact same thing she did 29 years after she did it. She's like, I was here before yeah, I, it was cool. Yeah, copycats. Yeah, she's, she's just sitting there going, I was like, I warned you. I warned you, but did you listen? I mean, again, to be fair, I keep reiterating this point. They were an isolationist empire. They did not want much contact with the outside world. And I could imagine why, but... Yeah, you look a golden gift more gift horse in the mouth, and this is what happens. Oof. All I'm saying is, they kind of did it to themselves. A little bit, little bit. Yeah. Maybe if you don't have a very, you know, isolationist policy that uh, favors the superiority of your own culture and more or less your own aristocracy. You might live to see the next century. Small counterpoint, though. Kind of badass they resisted the influence of the British up until 1939. 1839. 1839, sorry, correct. They didn't invade Poland, sorry. Yeah, no, no. Chang Shi dies in 1944 then (laughs) in a small bunker somewhere in Germany. Oh, no! <laughs> is, is that where we send them forward a century? This is what happens. This is your alternate history, Justin. Oh no! Oh. But seriously though, like to resist the British, who at this time, at this point in history, were at their physical strongest, is yep. is incredible. Like we we joke about it and we make a lot of comments, but like to resist that influence and to resist that pressure to the point. Where the British have to not only drug your nation, but to start a war over this drug because they cannot get a foothold 
for your fancy little water leaves that, yep. you know, end up the causing Qing. a huge problem. What? But yeah. But yeah, they had... The, the thing is, the Qing had the warning signs 29 years early. They were handed a massive fleet, and they dismantled it. Yeah. Instead of saying, I have a thousand cannons and 600 warships, they said... That's going to cost a lot to maintain. Melt it down. <laughs> but that that's an interesting one. That's a fun one. That's been a, an interesting topic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Happy three years anniversary, everybody. Yeah. Yay. That's a great point for us to wrap up. Thank you guys for listening. Let us know what your highlight has been over the past three years. Let us know if you want us to force Cullum to take Mandarin. And we will see you guys if next week. We get 10,000 subscribers. Uh, do you force call them to no. do daily updates with Duolingo? That's got to be like a, a 500 or milli, a million subscriber threshold is I, making him take Mandarin. I have butchered Mandarin. I have butchered Japanese, French, Spanish. I believe at least some form of Danish or Dutch. I slammed it for difference. sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's been a lot. We, we could keep a tally of all the languages he's butchered, but we got to set some goal. Uh, next podcast will actually be about uh, Crazy Horse, so that's going to be a really fun one. You'll get to see me talk a lot about it, and we will see you guys next time. Peace.